this was a place that no kid should ever be put. And, you know, I'm just glad, honestly, that my mother didn't know how bad it was. James Ryle's mother left him at an orphan's home in Dallas after his father was sent to prison for armed robbery. James was only six years old. There were a lot of angry people that worked out there, and there was a lot of uh, very disturbing abuse that took place on their watch and by their hands. The most cruel method of punishment was a ritual called the belt line. The belt line was when all the boys in the dormitory lined up on the hallway and you had to lower your pants to your ankles so you couldn't take large steps and you couldn't run. You had to kind of shuffle down the hall while they hit you with belts. The Bible was mandatory reading at the orphanage, but that wasn't really a good thing. It was more used to, to manipulate and control and create, you know, kind of the fear that you know, God's going to send you to hell if you do that again. At 17, James left the orphan's home. The year was 1969. That was the crazy apex of the whole hippie thing that was going on in the 60s. And I fell right into the whole mix of that, which meant the drugs and everything that came with it. While driving all night with a friend over Labor Day weekend, James fell asleep at the wheel. James wasn't hurt in the crash, but his friend died instantly. Talk about standing under Niagara Falls. It's just an overwhelming sense of guilt and fear, shame, uh, and terror. James was arrested and charged with negligent homicide. He was desperate to get out of trouble, so he started selling drugs to raise money to hire a lawyer. Within two months, he was arrested for sales and possession of marijuana. He faced the possibility of up to 20 years behind bars. As he sat in the Dallas County Jail awaiting trial, James remembered a Bible verse from his days at the orphanage. The verse was Romans 8, 28, where we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And I realized God was saying, look, you can keep doing this your way or you can do it my way. Your way, you got what you got. My way, I can work this out in such a way that it will astonish you. So it was one of those, you know, no-brainer choices. <laughs> and so I remember saying, look, okay, I don't have, here's what's left of my life. You can have it. A few days later, a public defender met with James. He told him that he had worked out a plea bargain for a jail sentence of only two years. For them to offer me the absolute minimum was just shocking. I stared at him just, I just absolutely stunned that he said, two years? I said, well, okay, I'm guilty. I'll stand on my head for two years. Are you crazy? From the moment that James entered prison, he knew his life was firmly in God's hands. Being this aware of God's involvement in my life drew me back to the Bible. I just had this remarkable education download by the Holy Spirit that where the Bible started making profound sense to me. And during that whole process, Jesus became very real to me. And this whole truth of all things work together for good just anchored my life rock solid. A year into his sentence, James prayed for an early parole. He opened his Bible and read these words in the New Testament. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. When I read that, I knew two things. Number one, I'm getting out. and Number two, I'm supposed to tell people what the Lord has done. I have no power to make this happen, so all I can do is wait and see. James didn't have to wait long. One week later, he was called out of his cell and put into a pre-release program. On December the 22nd, 1970, I was released from the Texas State Penitentiary, and I knew God did this. So that sequence of all things work together for good, go home to your friends, uh, and then it happening pretty well sealed my faith into this place of, man, God is real, and I can trust him, and he means it when he says he will work things out. James returned home to Grand Prairie, Texas to share his story. The timing couldn't have been better. The Jesus movement was happening. 
and it gave me a ready-made audience, if you will, because they all wanted to hear my story. And so that really did begin the first phase of this ministry of telling others the good things of what the Lord has done. That ministry eventually brought James to Boulder, Colorado. He was appointed the pastor of Bethel Fellowship Church in 1982. Several years later, he became chaplain of the University of Colorado football team. He formed a close friendship with the team's coach, Bill McCartney. Together, they launched a Christian men's ministry known as Promise Keepers. Today, James is a best-selling author and public speaker, and he continues to tell people about the freedom that comes from giving your life to Christ. When we call out upon the Lord Jesus and say, help me, I I am in a situation that I cannot do anything about. That's how I was in the Dallas County Jail, but I was really bitter about it. And even in my bitterness, he bypassed all that, and he spoke to me and said, I'll work this out if you will hand your life over to me. I did, and he did. You can trust the Lord, and he will do his work in your life, and you will be so glad that he did.